Hi friends, this is Miss Crawford here, and I'm so excited to share with you a special story today. This story is so special to me because it reminds me of my mom's hometown and my grandparents that still live there. It reminds me of my mom's hometown because it is by the author Patricia Polacco. And Patricia Polacco happens to live in the exact same small town that my grandparents live in when my mom grew up. That small town is called Union City in Michigan. People from Michigan like to use the mitten to show where they're from. My mom's from right about here. That's kind of close to the Indiana border. And it's closer to the Lake Michigan side of the state. And also, this story is about a real store in their town called Hensley's. My mom has amazing memories of that place and the owner, John Sankrank, who's this man right here. Now my mom told me stories about how her and her brother would crawl on his legs and he would drag them around. And my grandma even helped out at the store every now and then when John needed help. John was a sweet and kind man and helped his community in many ways. He took people to doctor's appointments and helped out anywhere he could. You can be helpful in your community as well. Before we get reading something about Hensley's, I want to go over some vocabulary words that will help us understand the story a little bit better. Our first word is vexed. Hmm. Vexed. Do you notice how it has a d at the end? That means it happened in the past. Vexed means that you are confused. You're wondering. Hmm. This has me feeling vexed. I don't really know what to do. Our next word is a word I love to use. It is catastrophe. Ah, what part of speech do you think catastrophe is? A catastrophe means when something awful happens, the worst thing happens. It is a catastrophe. It is describing word. So that means it is an adjective. It's describing how bad the event is. How bad was that event? Oh, it was a catastrophe. I like to use a catastrophe often. For example, this morning we ran out of milk. It was a catastrophe because I couldn't use it in my cereal. Oftentimes, catastrophe can be used as an exaggeration, which means you're making it sound worse than what it actually is. Was it a real catastrophe, the worst thing ever, that I didn't have milk for my cereal? No, but in my mind it was. The next word can be kind of tricky to read, and you'll see why. This word is perused. If you look closely at it, it says per used, but we don't read it as per used. It's perused, which means to look around. If you're at a store and you're perusing the aisles, if you're at a bookstore, you're perusing the books. You're looking around, taking your time, looking at each of the books. You're perusing. The next word is timidly. Do you notice how it ends in an L-Y? I wonder what part of speech timidly is if it ends in an L-Y. Let's first look at the base word, timid. <laughs> timid means when you're really shy. So maybe you meet someone for the first time and you're very shy. So you do something timidly it means you are doing something shyly. Timidly is an adverb. Notice how it's an L-Y. It's describing how you did something. She timidly spoke to the new person. Someone can be very timid and shy. Our next word is thriving. What part of speech do you think thriving is? Thriving means when you do some, when something's going very well, the best it can be. It is thriving. If you look at plants and they're growing and they look beautiful and they're blossoming, they're thriving. They're doing their best. Thriving is an adjective. It describes how they are doing. How is that plant going or how is that plant doing? It is thriving. Our next word is genuine. Some people like to say genuine for fun, but it is genuine. When someone or something is genuine, that means it's for real. It's accurate. It is authentic. When someone is genuine, they are being sincere. You can trust them. The antonym or opposite for genuine is fake. 
So you don't want to be fake. You want to be genuine. Our next word is pondered. Hmm, I wonder what that word means. Pondered. Well, I notice it has an ed at the end. That means it happened in the past. So it, they already did it. Hmm, if I ponder, that means I'm wondering. I'm thinking. I'm taking time to think about something. I am pondering. Pondered mean you ponder. It was happened in the past. I already pondered. This morning, I pondered on what clothes I wanted to wear. Our next word is exuberant. Exuberant is an adjective as well. It describes how you might feel. Exuberant is when you are excited. You're so happy. You're ready to go. You are exuberant. I feel exuberant about being able to share this special story with you. Our next word you might already know. It is wailed. Now it doesn't mean when a whale, the animal does something. It means whale as in crying. Have you ever heard a baby wail when you're crying loudly and needs attention? It's wailing. But instead of wailing, it's whale duh. That means it happened in the past. Do you notice how that ed makes a duh sound in the word whale duh? Knowing these words will help me understand the story better. The first time I read this story to you, I want you to focus on comprehending the meaning of the story. What did you learn from the story? I want you to be able to give me five. The first part being, who are the main characters? How would you describe their character traits? How would you describe their personality? What did they look like? How do you think they were feeling throughout the story? Secondly, I want you to be able to tell me the setting of the story. Where does it take place? Can you tell me what season it is in? Maybe the illustrations will help you with this. The last three, I want you to focus on telling me the beginning, middle, and end of the story. So how does the story begin? The middle part is, what problems do the main characters face? And then the last one is, how are the problems resolved? What is the solution of the story? How does the story end? When Patricia Polacco writes stories, she typically includes multiple problems and solutions. Can you figure out what they are by listening to the story? The second time you read the story, and you can do this by going back in our video and listening to it again. It doesn't have to be right now. It can be later today or tomorrow or another time when you have free time. But when you do listen to it again, I want you to think about literal and non-literal phrases. You can make a T-chart either on paper or you could use a device or you could just talk about it with someone. Now remember, a literal phrase is something that can be taken for what you're saying. So for example, if I'm saying, be quiet, that means I want you to be quiet. Or when someone is saying, he told her the secret, that means he told her the secret. There is no hidden meaning literal. However, when something's non-literal, that means there is a hidden meaning to it. There's a little secret. You have to be able to understand what the person is really saying. For example, when we read Roberto Clemente, Pride of the Pittsburgh Pirates last week, we talked about how the phrase how he had a fever for baseball. Now, did he actually have a fever for baseball? No, it meant that he had a passion for baseball. He really loved baseball. So fever was used as a way to describe his passion. It was a non-literal phrase that the author chose to use. Throughout the story, Patricia Polacco uses literal and non-literal phrases. Let's see if you are gonna be able to determine which is which. While you're listening to the story for the second time, you can go ahead and pause it when you hear a literal or non-literal phrase. I wonder how many you're gonna be able to find. Once you're done with the story, feel free to share with me your literal and non-literal phrases. You can do that on Class Dojo or emailing me. I am so excited to see what you're going to be able to find. Now, let's get into our story. Something about Pinsley's. Hmm. Do you notice the cover? What adjectives would you use to describe it? 
remember adjectives are describing words. I would describe this cover as bright and colorful. It's also very detailed. She took time to draw all the little candies and took detail in drawing his sweater vest. I wonder what genre this story might be. Let's read something about hem sleeves. This is one of my favorite parts of the story as well. This is a signature from the author, Trisha Polacco. And it says, Old John Songkramp. When this book came out, Union City had a big celebration to celebrate this book and John Songkramp. My grandparents went to it and were able to get a signed copy from, from Patricia Polacco. Which I think is something very special. Something about Hensley's. There's just something about Hensley's. You see, no matter what a body may need, you're sure to find it there. Why they have everything from clothespins to model airplanes, antiques to fiddle strings, makeup to hornet spray to scrumptious candy counters filled with goodies. On any given day, townsfolks gather there. They just find themselves leaning back and talking to old John Songkran himself. He owns Hensley's now. Sometimes patrons linger there, not even knowing why. One thing is John Song Cramp is downright magical, or so folks thinks around here. He's the heart of the store. He has warm eyes that crinkle and dance, a sweet smile, and a comforting hug for whoever may need one. And it doesn't matter what anyone comes in to buy. Old John has it. Why, there was the time Thermo Mosswood came in, all in a dither. I have a catastrophe, Mr. Songkrant, she said. My bridge club is coming today, and I need one more place setting of Garden Rose dishware by noon. It's discontinued pattern, and no one has it. I've been everywhere. No sooner had her words hit the air than old John was holding up two boxes of Garden Rose dishware. Why, that's the very thing, Mrs. Mosswood said breathlessly. And then there's a time that Tommy Ivo dashed into the store, all out of breath and vexed with botheration. Mr. Songkran, I have a track meet in 15 minutes and the cleats just broke off one of my track shoes. No sooner had Tommy said it than old John was holding a shoebox. But what a shame, Tommy, he said. There's only one track shoe in here. I don't rightly know what could have happened to the other. Tom took the box. It's the left shoe, Mr. Songkran. Exactly the one I need. And it's my size. Why, it's the very thing. Tommy won his race that day. And who doesn't know about the day little Sally Turnbow came into the store so worried that it took four handfuls of gumdrops to calm her down. She had broken her mother's favorite lamp and didn't know what to do. Have you ever broken anything on accident and didn't know what to do about it? Hmm. Mama said that lamp was the only one like it in the whole world, she wailed. Old John went into his back room and out he came holding a very unusual lamp. Was it something like this? He asked. Why, that's it, Sally exclaimed. It's the very thing. One day, two little girls came timidly into the store. They pressed their faces up against the candy case. Can I help you with something? Old John asked them. We're just looking, the older girl said nervously. We don't have any money, the younger one blurted out. Old John smiled. He heard mother move into town with two little girls alone. 
I'm Molly, the older one said, and this is my little sister, Kate. How about I give you both a bag of candy to welcome you to Union City? Old John said as he stepped behind the candy counter and shoveled delicious morsels from the bins with a metal swoop. Do you notice how beautiful these illustrations are? Patricia writes the words and she also draws the illustration. I have the very thing for you. A bag of licorice for you, Molly, and a bag of caramels for you, Kate, and a bag of chocolate-covered cherries for your mom, Old John smiled. Don't be strangers now. You two and your mom can come see me anytime. You can find anything here at Hensley's, don't you know? From that time on, Kate and Molly made Hensley's a regular stop on their way home from school. Molly perused the books for sale at the back of the store. Kate dreamed over the stuffed gingham kittens. I bet you'd like a real kitten, wouldn't you, Kate? Old John asked one day. Always, Kate said wishfully. But Molly's allergic to them. Does your mother know there are shots that Molly could take so that you could have a kitty and it wouldn't bother her? Old John asked. Hmm. Well, we're renting, Kate said. We can't have any pets. Mr. Sankran thought there was more to her story. One day, a sweet, exuberant woman bounded into Hensley's. Mr. Sankran, I'm Mary McCarty. Kate and Molly are my girls. She thrusted her hand towards Old John. They sure love coming to the store. Mrs. McCarty shook Old John's hand vigorously. Then she looked at her watch. I wonder where they are now. I was supposed to meet them here and we were going to have an early dinner at the diner. She rechecked her watch. Just then the front door of the store crashed open and Kate came bursting in. Mama, Molly can't breathe, Kate cried. Mary rushed over to the door and found Molly wheezing and gasping for air. Now wait, Mr. Songkrant said as he helped Molly and her mother to the back of the store. I have a steamer. I'll set it up right away. Mr. Miller, the village pharmacist, was in the next aisle and looked around the corner. Does she have a rescue inhaler? Molly mother shook her head no. I can run and get one right away. Now I need a prescription. About then, a round, jolly looking man peered out from the fishing rods. I'm a doctor. Perhaps I can be of assistance he said as he took a stethoscope from his bag. I'll need that inhaler, a nebulizer, and a chest pack, pronto. He drew a syringe, filled it from a small vial, and gave her a shot. She should breathe much easier now. In no time, Molly could breathe. Molly's mother looked at the doctor. I, I can't pay you, doctor, Mrs. McCartney said, her eyes filling with tears. Old John took the doctor aside. This little family seems to be having such a hard time, doctor, Mr. Sawcrant began. But I can plainly see that you are a champion fisherman. I saw you admiring the antique rod and reel in the front window. The doctor nodded yes. Well, sir, I have this old tackle box stuffed clear full of the finest fly lures there ever were. The doctor's eyes widened. They are all hand tied, don't you know? Each one, one of a kind. Are you offering those lures to me? The doctor asked as he tried not to show how much he wanted them. Old John nodded. The doctor pondered for a moment. Hmm. Tell you what. You throw in that antique rod and reel, and going forward, I'll treat that child for free for any charge, the doctor said. Done deal, doctor, 
old John Bean. They went over to Mary and the girls. I'm Dr. Case, Mrs. McCarty. You bring your girl over to my office in cold water tomorrow. We'll do everything we can to get Molly's asthma under control. Mary cried and hugged Dr. Case. Then she hugged old John and finally her girls. I told you, Mama, Kate said. Hensley's has everything, even a doctor to help Molly. After that, Mary was a believer in Hensley's. She too became a regular. One night, she stayed late just to talk to old John. She told him the whole story, that the girl's father had left, that she was a single mom and a college student, and that her landlord had raised her rent for the second time in a year. I just don't know what I'm going to do. Old John said, things will change for you, Mary. I can feel it. How would you describe John's character traits? Is he helpful, kind, considerate? One day when she stopped in, Mary noticed old John clearing off a whole section of shelves. Always wanted to sell genuine hand-painted pottery. Don't you reckon the store needs something like that? Old John asked Mary with a twinkle in his eye. Mary looked surprised. But John, did you know I used to be a potter? I threw my own pieces, designed and painted them too. Psh, you don't say, you a potter? Mary smiled and nodded. Well, Mary, you're exactly what I'm looking for. You don't suppose you could make some for me? Maybe I could sell some of your pottery right here at Hensley's. Oh, John, it's been years. My pottery wheel's in storage. Besides, I need a kiln for the fire pieces, and I don't even have one anymore. You see, when you make pottery, you have to fire it in a kiln to protect it so it won't break and dries out everything. Old John's eyes twinkled as he led Mary downstairs through the antique store and then through a back room door. In the corner of the furnace room, he pulled out a tarp, and there it was, a kiln. I traded old Long Ferry for it two years ago. He even threw in all these glazes. John pointed to rows and rows of colors. Do I dare dream? Mary whispered. It would be a dandy way to earn that extra money you need, wouldn't it? Old John sang out. Mary thought for a time. Mr. Songcramp, Mary said dreamily, I think we are in business. How do you think Mary is feeling right now? Well, sir, Mary set up a studio right there in Hensley's basement. Pretty soon, people were coming from far and wide to buy her one-of-a-kind dishes, platters, teapots, and mugs. Before long, she had a thriving business. She called it All Fired Up. She stayed in school all right, got her teaching credentials, and a got a job teaching. With that and the sale of her pottery, she and her girls were able to buy a sweet little house with a big front porch and a hanging swing. Hensley's, of course, had the perfect paint colors, the exact wallpaper, and just the right curtains for the windows. Always the very thing that was needed to make a house a home. Molly, Kate, and their mom had everything they wanted. Almost. I wonder what they're missing. One day, Molly and Kate marched into Hensley's on their way home from school. Kate had something on her mind. Everybody in my family got just what they needed at Hensley's, Mr. Songcramp. What do I need? Kate asked. Here, Kate, you need this basket. And Molly, you need this step stool, Old John said. The girls looked puzzled. Hmm. And when you leave the store, take High Street home. But High Street's two blocks out of the way, Molly grumbled. Take it anyway, girls, he said as he whisked them both to the front door and popped chocolate raisins into each of their mouths. This 
basket is heavy. Kate whined as she dragged it along. And this step stool isn't exactly light, Kate, Molly snapped. But then the tiniest sound seemed to be coming from directly above them. They looked up. At first they didn't see anything, but then they heard it again, a faint little cry. The leaves rustled and moved. That's when they saw, barely clinging to a branch, a tiny, fluffy, sweet little kitten, not two blocks from Hensley's. Do you suppose this is the very thing? Kate sang out. Molly quickly set up the step stool, climbed up and rescued the little kitten. Kate held the basket as Molly gently dropped the kitten in. Then it purred and nestled into Kate's arms as it was meant to be there. Oh, Molly, Mr. Songkran, he, why, it is the very thing, Kate whispered as she stroked the wee little head. Kate, Molly whispered, if we hadn't had this basket in the ladder, and if we hadn't come this way, we wouldn't have found this kitten. Then they looked at each other. Hensley's, they whispered in awe. Well, Kate and Molly named that little kitten Hensley. And do you know, they loved that little kitten so much that from that time on, whenever they thought about their dad being gone, they were full of so much love, they didn't feel sad anymore. They found out what everyone in Union City knows. There's something about Hensley's and old John too. They also know there isn't anything you can't find in Hensley's. And whatever that might be, it will always be the very thing. Thank you so much for listening to this story. I hope you enjoyed it just as much as I did. Remember to be able to give me five by the end of this video. And listen to the story again to find literal and non-literal phrases. I hope to see you guys soon, and I will continue to post stories up here so you can listen to them and interact with them. Have a great day. I miss you all. Remember that you are loved and special in every way. Bye!